Brian Stewart, what an absolute honor and privilege to have you on Let's Dive Straight In. Uh, you know, you, you probably don't remember it, but you're a big part of the, the reason that I'm swimming because you started a swimming club in Vintuk back in the 70s. And I joined the swimming club Spartans in 1976 when you'd already left. But your name was larger than life for many reasons. Uh, tell me, Brian, where did it start for the young Brian Stewart? Because I believe you only started swimming at the age of 10. Yes, um, I grew up in, in Southwest Africa, today Namibia. And as you probably well know, water is not very uh, common in many parts, especially places like Ludritz and so on. Uh, but when my father was transferred to Tsume, uh, the recreation club that was built by the mining company uh, had a lovely little swimming pool there, 33 and a third yard swimming pool with diving boards and so on. And we as children, we spent our days there whenever we could during the summer. In the winter, the pool was empty, but in the summer, we uh, played around that pool. And I only learned to swim when I was roughly about 10 years old. And uh, so it was more a case of swimming underwater, jumping in, jumping off the diving board and that type of thing. Oh, uh, well, that's awesome. You know, just being in the water. Some of us, we, we live when we're in water. So... Tell me, who was your coach, Brian? Who's the, who's the, who was at, at the age of 10? Who was the big influence in your swimming career? Who, who sort of is the reason that you became Brian Stewart, the Springbok swimmer? Um, there was an old man called McClellan who saw me playing around there uh, one day. And he came to me and he said, I'd like to teach you how to swim properly. And he started coaching me. Now... You must also just remember that in those days, uh, we had what was called crawl, or freestyle today, mostly. Um, we had two backstrokes. The one was a double arm backstroke with a breaststroke kick, and which was called backstroke. And the backstroke as we know it today was called back crawl stroke. That's interesting. And then we had, uh, and then we had breaststroke as well. Butterfly didn't exist. So uh, he, coached, he coached me and a few other guys. One of my friends, John McDooling, who always used to beat me in especially the freestyle or crawl, but he could never beat me in backstroke or the back crawl stroke as he swam it then. So uh, that's basically where it started. That's very, very interesting. So you're from the PB era, pre-butterfly era of swimming. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> we, heard, we had heard about it, but... Uh, it was just too strange to swim, you know. Uh, and when we tried it, uh, we did it with a breaststroke kick. The dolphin kick was way beyond our, our uh, capacity to actually uh, master, master the, the stroke. Now, it's interesting. Joan Harrison mentioned that uh, I think her sister swam butterfly. At, at one stage, her and her sister held all the South African records in, in, in all the different events. And Joan mentioned that she didn't swim butterfly. Her sister swam butterfly. And I remember starting in 76 in Vintuk, a lot of people still did, especially the breaststrokers when they swam butterfly, they had the breaststroke kick with the butterfly. I actually forgot about that. That's incredible. I mean, a lot of things have changed. A lot of things have changed for the, for the backstroke as well, or the back crawl, as you call it. But we'll, get, we'll touch on that later. From, from Tumep, uh, was it there that you swam your first competitive gala? Because I believe your mom was not very encouraging in the beginning. She said, there'll, there'll always be someone better than you. Yes, yes. She... They didn't really take, they were, they were great golfers. And both my father and mother won Southwest African golfing championships in their categories and so on. But swimming was kind of a thing you do for relaxation. My mother couldn't swim at all. Uh, my dad was a side stroke swimmer. He learned in the Orange River. And a side stroke, you go on the side. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, that was quite funny. But anyway... Uh, no, they, they, they didn't really give me much support, uh, but we used to swim one school gala a year. Um, either our inter, inter kind of house, if you like, or against another, another uh, town like Kurtfontein or Tavi or so on. And that was it. it that's fascinating. Uh, in, in Namibia, most people, Susan and Afrikaans, say, I'll have swim with the stuff, <laughs> absolutely absolutely yeah <laughs> okay brian from from southwest africa or uh or namibia as people know now you guys moved to pretoria 
And uh, I that's think right. that's where your career really got a boost. Tell me more about that. I think you went to Uffis. Uh, what what school, yes. high school did you go to? Yes, I went to Uffis. Um, and again, in Uffis, swimming was not seen as a big sport. As you know, Uffis is a big rugby, rugby school today still. Uh, but uh, a friend of mine, Dion Reda, he actually convinced me to, uh, to go to Hillcrest uh, Swimming Club okay. on a Friday night and just participate among uh, the club members there. And I wasn't all that interested, but anyway, I went and I ended last in uh, doing a two lengths of the 55 yard pool, which is down to 50 meters. Um, and I came last in uh, for freestyle crawl. And, uh, and I said, because my brothers had always warned me that I think I'm big stuff in swimming, winning <laughs> swimming, but when I get to, when I get to proper competition I'm, I'm going to get a hiding and that night I got a hiding so <laughs> it was quite quite uh, disturbing for me but anyway I said no 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 I funny that we are doing it so um, but Dion kept pestering me and we still friends today and he, okay. he kept pestering me and he said uh, yeah come, it's no rush luck for none so I went again because backstroke was my my better better stroke and uh, and I swam the two lengths. It was terribly far, 100 or 110 yards. I didn't know how to turn. Uh, and in the second length, as I came towards the end of the pool, I saw I was first. I didn't know I was swimming against. And I got out of the water and a, a, a guy came up to me and his name was Malan from Rensburg. And he said, feels to luck. I only later heard he was the Northern Transvaal Junior Schools champion. In backstroke oh, wow. and we've remained friends ever since i actually lived with their family for quite a while um, trained together for many many years uh, and that's where it started and and, and the local coach tony consolican he noticed me in the water and they kind of all were standing around the var from dick nappy from down out of out of out of the sand dunes of southwest africa and where did you learn to swim that type of thing and uh I said, no, well, you know, I just learned to swim. And that's basically where it started. Brian, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm actually fascinated uh, by the fact that, you know, your mom said, don't worry, there'll always be someone better than you. And then you, you come last in your first proper gala uh, when you were at office, yet you came back. There had to be something inside, either inside of you or, or destiny, as we call it, that Imagine swimming not being part of your life after that first Friday gala. I mean, I can't, I can't imagine to think what your life would have been without swimming because I, I pick up that swimming is, is, is your life. Uh, you know, obviously, obviously family and everything else. But, you know, we also need time away from all of that. And what do we do? And swimming is such a big part of your life. And you've contributed as a swimmer and as a coach massively uh, to the history of South African swimming. Uh, you were, you were very kind and you shared a very personal book that you wrote to your kids and, and, and said to me, I can only read the swimming part, but I, you know me, uh, inquisitive journalist, I read a bit, bit of the other stuff as well. Um, you mentioned there that Afis wasn't very supportive and, and you said you know, a rugby school and it really griped you that they would allow rugby teams to go and tour and play, but you as swimming captain tried to take the swimming team. Talk to me about that and how... Did that motivate you to become even a better swimmer and show them? Yeah, I, 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 I think I'm a bit hard-headed, hard as they say. And, uh, a bit? <laughs> <laughs> no, ask my wife. <laughs> we'll send her the link. The school swimming wasn't a big sport. So at one stage, we had a small swimming team of about eight swimmers, and I wanted to take them to swim against Helpenkar and uh, Kess in yes. Johannesburg. So we needed a combi or something like that, a small bus to take us across. Our principal was a guy called Dr. Potgitter. He was, uh, his nickname was Phone, and he was the secretary at that stage of the South African Rugby Board. Okay. Second most powerful man in rugby be uh, behind Donny Craven. And, um, Anyway, he just refused and he said no. So I was very cheesed off as you can imagine. And uh, that same year, our matric uh, 
uh, first team rugby team, toured by Union Castle Line from Cape Town right round Port Elizabeth, East London, Durban, played all the top schools, uh, 30 players plus teachers, everything, you know. And, and that disjuncture between swimming and rugby always bugged me. It, was, it, it actually became a little bit of a hang-up I had for many years, even when I was coaching, that uh, swimming was not given its proper place. Yeah. And, uh, but today I understand. I mean, rugby is obviously a much bigger sport, uh, international, but as an individual sport, swimming, I thought, was getting a bit of a raw deal. Yeah, uh, I specifically asked the question because, and, and you've answered what I wanted to allude to, is that the fact that you were mis not mistreated, but you didn't get what you thought you deserved as a swimmer because of rugby, made that I, I think you fended very hard for your swimmers when you were coaching. Uh, you, you, you called it an injustice. Yes. So it made you maybe a bit more harakat, and, and, and I think maybe you missed out a bit, but I think your swimmers uh, benefited massively because of that. Uh, injustice. Let's call it injustice for, for lack of a better term. Uh, Brian, I want to touch on, on, on your uh, you know, qualifying going to nationals. You were still at school when you, when you went to your first nationals. Curry Cup as we yes. call it today. And, and who were your my competitors? First cup, my first Curry Cup was 1961 in Kimberley. Uh, Alain from Rensburg and I were riding by bicycle down to Hillcrest Swimming Pool at 6 o'clock in the morning to go and train. And he shouted to me and he said, Brian, you had in Nootrasvall's fun gemaakt. Oh, wow. And I said, and I said what is Nootrasvall? <laughs> I had no clue. I, had, I was totally naive. I had no clue. Anyway, uh, to cut a long story short, uh, that was my first Curry Cup. I was at that stage, I was 15 years old. Incredible. Uh, I was going to turn 16 about two weeks after Curry Cup. And... Um, I came sixth. We only swam the, the 110 yards backstroke at, yep. that, uh, at that stage. The 220 yards backstroke only uh, became an event the, the following year. Okay. And um, the guy who won was uh, uh, Peter Hugo. He, he was the South African champion at that stage, a very nice guy. And uh, I was gobsmacked. We had all these good, older, much more experienced swimmers. I was 15 years old. I swam as best I could, and I came about sixth in the finals. We didn't have heats those years, okay. so we just entered into the final and we swam. That's that's fantastic, Brian. Um, I want to get. I wanted to get to that later, but I spoke to Kubis uh, the other day uh, again, and uh, South Africa seemed to have delivered incredible backstrokers of of world world class backstrokers. You know, Karen Muir, Joan Harrison, yourself, Lee McGregor was a backstroker. Or, even though I think he could swim just about everything and, and, and win it. Uh, why do you think, is, is there a specific reason, especially your era, they were incredible backstrokers who, who were world beaters, best in the world? Yeah, yeah. yeah look, uh, we've never had, uh, in the era that I was swimming, the, the equivalent of Anne Feli and, and Karen Muir as the world beaters, top two backstrokers in the world. Then Anne was top, then Corin was top, then Anne was top. The two of them were, were constantly breaking world records. And uh, that was quite unique. I was, I was rated in top 10 in the world myself. Um, I was about 1. 1. 1.6 seconds off the 110 yards backstroke, the world record. And I tied with John Moncton, who at that stage was the world record holder in Durban, I think in 1966. Wow. Um, but to answer your question, backstrokers, yes, we've had a lot of very good backstrokers. Um, I don't know. I think it's probably a, a matter of coaching, you know, the yeah. type of coaches that we had, maybe concentrated. And then another maybe important consideration is that in things like 100, 100 meters or 110 yards freestyle, all the freestyle events, except maybe the very long one, uh, the competition is very harsh. Yeah. And in your more specialized strokes, we ha tend to have fewer competitors. And that tends, I think, to also encourage the younger swimmers to go for yeah. specialist uh, type strokes. But also, I, I see, and I, I think it was uh, the case with Joan Harrison, it was certainly the case with Lee McGregor. And uh, I, 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 I looked at Anne Fairley, she just about won everything she swam. And, and I know in, in my era, or just before me, was Karen van Elden, who was 
probably first a backstroker, but also did very well in freestyle. You also won a couple of uh, national titles in, in the freestyle as well, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. In the first, in the first case, um, I became the first South African individual medley champion uh, for the 200 or 220 yards individual medley, where we had, um, uh, it was introduced for the first time in South Africa then. Yeah. And I won because my butterfly was not bad. I actually made the finals a couple of years in butterfly. Uh, my breaststroke was terrible. I couldn't swim breaststroke to save my life. And in swimming, you do a lot of freestyle or crawl training. Yes. So you, you, yes. tend to, you tend to develop strength in that as well. Okay. And I eventually won the 110, actually came uh, second and third in the 200 uh, freestyle and in the 100 freestyle. And then in 1967, I won the, the 100, 100 meters or 110 yards uh, freestyle title as well. Okay. And I was also, uh, uh, one of my big rivals was a guy called John Reen. Yeah. And jo uh, Jeff Bills, obviously, as well. Yeah. yeah. And, and John one day said to me in London, he said, backstrokers are nothing. <laughs> he says, the blue ribbon event is the 100 meters freestyle. And three years later, I beat him. <laughs> in, in, in the freestyle? <laughs> Did you beat him in the freestyle? Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. Yes, yes. He, he came second. <laughs> okay. Is that guy going to pour us a beer in the background there? Yes. Uh, would you like to score for? Uh, listen, listen, Brian, uh, you mentioned John Reen and Jeff Grills. Now, you were part... Uh, of the very first South African Rebel Tour in 1964. You went to England, right. if I'm not mistaken. Talk to me about that because uh, you guys weren't well, maybe by the swimming community welcomed by, by, with open arms, but maybe the rest of the guys were not so happy to have you guys there. Yeah, I think during that era, the, the South African sporting fraternity in general were not uh, kindly uh, looked upon by the international community. Uh, that was also the year where our cricketers and our rugby players started having problems in, in the international, international competitions. Um, in fact, David de Villiers and the rugby team that in that particular year came to watch us uh, train at, in, in Hillbrow. And uh, they also sent us good luck in the British Championships. And they had a lot of problems with their tour that year in England as well. Was that 64? Um, 64? We were one. 64, yes. Uh, we won, as Jeff also said the other day, we won nine out of the 11 British titles. Yeah. And uh, the, the, the British TV, they were, they were flabbergasted. Because when, for instance, in Jeff's uh, 200, 220-yard uh, freestyle event, we were first, second, third, and fourth. <laughs> the first British swimmer came fifth, and there were only six finalists, so they only had two swimmers in the finals. And this upset them to a large degree, and when we walked to fetch out our trophies, we wore our Springbok uh, gowns. And that was the first time that television actually picked up that we were not just swimming for clubs in South Africa, as Jeff explained to you a while back. Yeah. Uh, that we were actually a Springbok team. That is a beautiful and, uh, that that uh, yeah that gave rise to quite a lot of uh, reaction. We started finding uh, posters, political posters in our dressing rooms, and uh, I got into trouble for almost uh, assaulting one of the British swimmers uh, for his political political uh, utterances on what we did. And we said we swimmers, we're not politicians. Yeah. And when we went to Edinburgh by invitation to swim against England and Scotland, uh, the, the swimming pool was poisoned with Condis crystals, potassium permanganate. And we, the whole uh, international was cancelled as a result. Uh, we only found out later because the press took it up as an as a action against the South African team. But we only found out later that it was actually the Scottish nationals who were protesting against the English team participating. So that was a strange quirk uh, in, in, in politics. But yeah, we were the, one of the first teams to actually find 
political uh, act activists against us. It's nice to know, you know, I, I grew up in the, in the 70s as a swimmer and I know the rest of the world didn't really like uh, to compete against us much, but it's nice to know that the English hated the Scottish even more than they hated the South Africans. So I think it's still the case today. <laughs> Brian, talk to me about your coach. I think Bob Campbell, was he your, your coach at, the, at that stage? Yes, he was, he was my ultimate coach. Uh, at, after I trained for about a year with Tony from Silicon, then I went to Pop Dyson. Uh, Pop was very old school and so on. And I, I, under him, I became South African 220 backstroke champion. And shortly after that, I left and went to Bob Campbell. Uh, he was an Australian and he started building up the Northern Transvaal uh, swimming teams and had a lot of success. Um, so much so that in our last couple of years at Curry Cup, we totally dominated the South African Swimming Championships and the Ellis Brown Trophy and so on. That's fantastic. And uh, as a coach, uh, you obviously became a coach when you stopped swimming, but I don't want to get to that now. Any of these coaches that, that had the biggest impact in your becoming a swimming coach? Um, I trained with, uh, with Niels Baus in, in Cape Town for a, for a holiday. And Niels actually introduced me, if you like, to a more modern way of coaching and, okay. and the interval training and that type of thing, um, which led to my uh, going to Bob Campbell. Uh, and then, yeah, the international coaches like uh, Dr. Councilman, um, okay. George Carlisle, Terry Cathercole, those were all, I did a lot of reading. A lot of research, even while I was swimming, I used to analyze uh, our strokes. I used to analyze turns, practice, practice, practice. And uh, so I read Doc Council's book. And Bob Campbell was one of those type of coaches who constantly encouraged us to learn as much as we could, not just to be automatic in up and down, up and down a pool, yeah. but to think while we swim. He always said, work smarter. Don't, don't work hard, but work smarter. That, and uh, those lessons, I think, that st stuck with me for the rest of my life. That's fascinating because uh, John T. Skinner in the interview also alluded to that. And I think John T. became also one of the coaches that really focused on the technical side. You know, I'm always fascinated by people who look at something that's not broken and think, I can still do this better. You know, I can improve on this. Uh, yes. Sort of like an engineer's way of thinking, you know, looking at a swimming stroke and thinking, it's working, the guys are breaking world records, but maybe there's a better way of doing it. And, uh, yeah. Uh, and and that only comes through watching others and reading and, 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 and making mistakes, not being afraid to make mistakes along the, along the way. Yeah, that's why Jeff Grills was fascinating as a swimmer, because he was so light. He was six foot three, I think, and, and he weighed about 130 pounds those years. So he was extremely light. He floated on top of the water, kept his head high, was totally from a technical perspective should never have won anything you know really but because of, because of his his uh, uh power weight ratio and his, the way he swam he was he was an amazing swimmer uh, that is fantastic to you and he's an he's an incredible human being as well i was so privileged to yeah. to meet him and, and chat to him tell me uh you mentioned jeff grills and and some of the other guys that you swam with especially in that tour to england but some of the, you swam with some of the, the most iconic female swimmers. You mentioned Karen Muir and, and Anne Fairley. Tell me about them. Yeah. And, and I, I believe you helped Karen Muir with a, with a backstroke start, which was quite... Uh, That's right. Uh, people said she was slow, slow out of the blocks, last out of the blocks. But uh, tell me about that. The history, the history of that start is very interesting. Um, when we went to England, uh, to America, to the USA Championships in, in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, in 1966, uh, we trained in a, in a pool where the scum channel was hidden under the water. Oh, okay. And it stuck out almost about a foot under the water. Okay. Um, and Anne Fairley, in backstroke, hit her arm quite badly and, and, and actually injured her elbow quite severely so much so that she had difficulty swimming properly. Uh, and, I, and I was worried that it's going to happen to me as well. So I, I then went and got myself a nose clip. And okay. on approaching, on going past the backstroke flags, I dropped my head into the water to see the wall underwater and to be able to then hit, because those years, you had to hit the wall with your hand. Okay. Uh, 
uh, to turn. Not not like today where no. you turn on your stomach and you need to uh, you only need the touch of your feet. Yeah. So that uh, changed the whole turn. So I actually disappeared for the last two strokes underwater. Hit the hit the turn came out very very uh, fast. Um, the American coaches were were fascinated by that and took videos and so on and said this fastest turn they've ever seen. Anyway, from that, we, we developed a start as well. Okay. We, we had to start with our feet under the scum channel with no uh, friction pads or anything like that under the water. So the tiles were very slippery. And each time you pulled yourself up towards the starting block, the chances were very high that you were going to slip and have a very poor start. Yeah. So I again developed a start where instead of pulling myself up, I, I went back into the water till my ears touched the water. And then I preempted sometimes with a false start, but I preempted the starter's gun and pulled myself up in a very rapid movement through the air uh, to dive into the water on my back. Oh, like a coiled spring. And, yeah. And, and, uh, to a large degree, people, you, you actually hit the water after most of the other, other backstrokers have done so. But you come out with a lot more force because yeah. of the explosion from the, from the wall. And I taught Karen that, that particular start. And people, because the focus was on her largely, never saw me do it. They saw her doing it and they always said she's starting late. But they never watched where she came out. Yeah. After the start, she was usually half a meter ahead of everybody else already, just because of the power that she came off the wall. That is so that incredible. Was, that's incredible, that's uh, Brian. I mean, we, uh, uh, Greg Carswell always, uh, you know, when I spoke to Joan Harrison, he came, came back to me and he said, that is proper South African swimming royalty. I mean, it doesn't get much better than Anne Fairley and, and Karen Muir as well. And you, you were able to swim with these swimmers and, yeah. and, you know, learn from them and also teach them. I mean, that is a yes. pretty special part of, of South African history. But Brian, you've touched yeah. many people's lives as a swimming coach. Uh, let's, let's go back. So w when you stopped swimming, um, you actually went back into swimming coaching and you moved back to, to Vintuk, I, I believe. That's right. I, I went back to Vintuk. Uh, Sorry, be, be, born... before, we, before we go there, uh, you stopped swimming because South Africa was sort of kicked out of the Mexican oh. Olympic Games and it was... Do you think yes. if, if you guys had the opportunity to go, you would have continued swimming? How old were you when you stopped swimming? I, I was kicked out, or we were kicked out, first of all, out of the Tokyo Games in 64. And then in 68, we were kicked out of the Mexico Games. Oh. The Mexico Games was specifically bad because I went to Vintuk because Vintuk is very high above sea level and uh, Mexico City as well. Yeah, and the reason I went started coaching, went uh, started swimming there, was to prepare myself for the Mexican Games, and um, we had already received our letters of invitation to to uh, participate in the games, and when Alex Bully wrote me the final uh, tearjerker saying, "Sorry guys, we're not going," yes, and uh, we were very disappointed. It was it was a shock, and at that point I decided, okay, that's it, I'm giving up. I was 24. And I decided, no, it's not worth the effort anymore. Because yeah. um, you must remember, we were really amateurs. We had to pay our way. We didn't get any sponsorship or any money to swim. So, uh, yeah, so that's when I turned uh, professional and started coaching. Uh, that's, in a sense, such a pity. But maybe you started a bit earlier as a coach and you had a long career as a coach. And you've, t you've impacted many swimmers' lives. Through, through coaching and, and thanks for the sacrifice, you know, being a coach first at the pool, last to leave the pool, uh, the sacrifices are enormous and huge and I'm, I've got so much gratitude to, towards the people who, who impacted my swimming career, uh, even though I never touched the heights that you guys were. Your, your first coaching uh, stint as a coach, talk, talk to me about that. Yeah, you talk about coaches sacrificing, I don't think it's a sacrifice. The, the it's an absolute pleasure okay. just working with the kids, working with the swimmers, seeing them perform uh, gives a person an immense amount of pleasure. And, and that is what makes us get up early in the morning 
cold swimming pool in Vintu, uh, which you probably recall. No, very well. Uh, <laughs> and and, uh, and then going out on galas all over the country and sometimes other parts of the world. But yeah, you know, it's not a sacrifice. It's really it's really just a, a pleasure to make a, a contribution and actually put something back yeah. into the sport for the young kids. And uh, I think if your heart's in the right place, then uh, the kids. They, they realize it very quickly. Uh, some of the parents don't. Yeah. The parents give us a lot of problems sometimes. But uh, the kids were my, the swimmers were my, uh, were my strength. Yeah, yeah you, I enjoyed that. You started Spartan Swimming Club and I joined Spartan Swimming Club in 1976 with Pete Dr. Berger. Uh, he was yeah. our um, yeah, I've got such fond memories of swimming in that pool against the Marlins, the, the German club. Uh, Dorothea Neumeister swam when Dorothea Neumeister was at the peak of her career. Tell me, swimmers that stood out for you during your coaching career. I know all swimmers are special to the coaches, and and uh, but swimmers that that sort of achieved amazing uh, achievements through your as with you as a coach. Um, I was very bad at coaching backstroke, and very good at coaching breaststroke. Wow. Which was my first stroke. Maybe because I was technical and I had to concentrate to do it properly. So, uh, Loretta Offenstein was, was my first Curry Cup swimmer and only the second to represent uh, Southwest Africa those years at Curry Cup. And she came fourth in the finals for the 100 uh, meters breaststroke, which surprised everybody. Uh, subsequently, in Bloemfontein, when we moved to Bloemfontein, I coached quite a number of top breaststrokers, uh, uh, Charles Fenter, Dougie Eager, uh, mm. and so on, and, and um, Monika Lawiskachny and so on, who all became Curry Cup swimmers, Springboks, some of them. And uh, it was just one of those things. And yeah, even while I was swimming, I enjoyed, the, as you said, the technical aspect. And another Springbok uh, swimmer that I helped in, in Hillcrestle was Obas Brock. Oh, yes. He became a spring stroker. And uh, yeah, those are some of those that stand out that I enjoyed working with and helping them to, to do better. Uh, Brian, you, you sent me a, a, a short video from your, from your house where you're staying now. You are literally a stone's throw away from the, from the beach. Did you ever get involved in surf lifesaving? No, unfortunately not. Um, <laughs> Surfing is something I've always wanted to do, and to do surf lifesaving like uh, Lee McGregor and so on, I think is, is a great sport. My grandchildren are now doing it, and I was just told yesterday that my granddaughter was given provincial colors for her surf lifesaving here That's in Durban. Beautiful. So I'm very proud of her. Yeah. I think we'll hear more about her. Uh, but I, I started enjoying water polo more in the oh, okay. masters category afterwards. Uh, I swam masters for quite a few years, but I actually started enjoying masters water polo as a team sport a lot more than, than uh, swimming. And uh, so I became more involved with the water polo, yeah. Okay. Um, you've obviously, uh, reading through your personal stuff, you've had your, your setbacks and tragedies in your, in your family life and, and uh, did, did swimming prepare, you know, swimming is a lonely sport. When you're swimming up and down, uh, you, you got to get something into your head and, and, and stay busy thinking. Otherwise, you give up. I mean, it's just how I was as a distance swimmer. And I think any swimmers, we, we spend a lot of hours thinking. How do you keep yourself positive and work through tragedies and, and maybe later in life, in business life, you're a serious businessman as well? Do you think your, your swimming discipline prepared you for that? Yeah. I have no doubt about that. Um, just getting up in the morning, swimming uh, uh, day in and day out. Um, yeah, it certainly did. Whether there's always been a kind of a debate in my mind between the benefits of team sport versus individual sport. I think both have benefits and both have drawbacks. And you learn, can learn from both. Yeah. Um, but I was very much an individual sportsman i was very focused on what i did and in the tragedies and so on that we had in, in my family and so on 
uh, yeah, I had to deal with that myself. I couldn't run away from that. I just had to face the consequences. Okay. So not always pleasant. No, exactly. I mean, life life gives you curveballs that you don't deserve, and sometimes, luckily, life gives you a lot more than you deserve. And and so it's highs and lows, and it's uh, mountain tops and valleys. But I I, yeah. I I agree with you that the discipline of doing the right thing at the right time, which is not always the nice thing, uh, does prepare you for for stuff in life. When 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 things are tough, you just got to get through it. You know, getting that first foot out of the bed is is sometimes a good start because if you stay in the bed, you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, uh, Brian, friends that you mentioned, uh, one or two names that you're still friends with today, the guy that took you to your Friday club gala. Any other swimming friends you're still in touch with? Oh, yeah, I'm in touch. And through people like Quibus, we've, we've actually picked up, and, and your program, we've picked up a lot of uh, friendships again. I mean, I, just after your interview with Jeff, I had a chat to Jeff and, and we touched sides for the first time in something like 40 years, you know? That's great. So uh, that was, and I, I thank you for that. Um, I'm in almost once a week touch with Shirley Van who was in our team to, to uh, the United States and, and uh, Europe and so on as well. Um, I was in touch with Karen before, her, before she died. Um, and fairly, I haven't been in touch directly with her. Uh, my best man at my wedding was, was a guy with a springbok butterfly called Harold Pierce. Okay. Uh, we've lost touch with each other. Hopefully, you'll see this and we'll get back together again. Come on, Harold. Um, let's, let's, get, uh, um, let's get you onto the show as well then. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah, chatting well, to Anne Fairley. I've, I've got Anne Fairley lined up as well, so I'll be chatting to Anne very soon. Uh, it, it gives me tremendous yeah. joy to to hear that people are connecting again because I think in essence that's probably my my thing in my life. I've always liked to connect people and I love stories. So this is for me a fantastic. You know, I know a little bit about swimming, and I know I know all these names, but I specifically want to talk to the guys from your era, the era before me, and maybe around my time because the guys after us got a lot of coverage and we know a lot about them, and but. You know, I, I I actually stayed in your house or with you in Bloemfontein on my first primary school, South African primary schools. When Pete Berger took us there, we stayed with Alan Louis with the Louis, and we we were sort of dished out. And I'm I, I'm sure I stayed with you guys as well. Uh, I remember you from those, and you actually came up to one or two of our swimming camps in Swakopmund as well, uh, in that saltwater That's pool right. in Swakopmund right. where. We, we had yeah. Brother Sebastian, I remember, you know, I, I cried so much, I emptied my goggles, and every time I looked up, I could only see his sandals. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> t tough days. Yeah, I, uh, I've had quite a few contacts. Loretta of the Stain in Namibia, uh, Manfred Lort used to swim with me, Jörg uh, um, Finkeldai. Jörg, I know very uh, well, yeah. We, we Ingolf, Ingolf Trimmer? Yeah. Sorry? Ingolf Trimmer, I don't know if you remember him. He was a long distance swimmer. Uh, and, and Heinz Violet. Uh, yes, I remember him. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Heinz Violet, very good swimmer. Um, and of course, Jacques Berger and, and uh, Pierre Berger as well. Yeah, so Jacques and Pierre were my age group. One was a year older and one was a year younger. And his sister, Karin, Karin Berger, who was a good butterfly swimmer. Uh, there's another guy that uh, you were sort of a, a influence on his on his backstroke, and he became. Uh, I think he was just after you, but you guys raced each other. So I've got a little message that someone sent me yesterday that I want to play to you, and and you can react uh, to this. So, I taste. I hope you're enjoying your interview with Brian Stewart. Um, I met Brian in the late '60s. He was a Northern Transvaal champion, a South African champion. Uh, very highly rated in the world and uh, I went to go to my first Northern Transvaal Championships and uh, it was at Hillcrest Pool. Brian was in lane five and one of our friends was next to him, one of his training partners and Brian was going to pull him through to try and do a qualifying time for Curry Cup in those days. Uh, the time was 1.12 and I was a lowly rated swimmer, I was swimming out in lane two. Um, so Brian didn't even know about me, let alone worry about me. But anyway, the pistol went and we, we flew off and uh, I had a really good first 50 and turned and uh, when I came out of the turn 
uh, I saw I was I, I, I sneaked a, a, a look and I saw I was well ahead of Brian and Johan but um, it was another 10 meters or so before Brian saw me and all he saw of me were my feet and he realized he was about to lose his Northern Transvaal title so he flew that last 30 meters and of course he caught me and beat me um, only just and when we got out the pool he actually said to me he said you will never come that close to beating me again and he was right because I never swam against him again that is the year that he retired he went to Curry Cup and retired after that but uh, before he did say so, he took me and uh, said I was going to be the, the next champion uh, in, in, in Pretoria and he showed me a few little hints about starts and turns etc uh, great to learn from a guy like him and uh, I hope you enjoy your interview with Brian isn't that special? I mean, that's, uh... that's, very, that's very special. I can actually remember that very, very well. I remember also the, the uh, helping him with his turns and the backstroke start and so on. And uh, he was a youngster, you know, and yeah, <laughs> I, I giggled because, you know, when I was swimming in the, when I won the British titles, uh, I swam against one of the Olympic uh, finalists, a guy called uh, Ralph Hutton. And uh, he came, he came fourth, I think, in the Olympics in, in uh, Tokyo. And he came up to me and he said, are you Brian Stewart? I said, yes. He says, you're the British champion. I said, yes. He says, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that was my first experience of psyching somebody out, you know. And he yeah. beat me in the 200, but I beat him in the 100 again, you know. So Lovely. It, was quite a, it was quite a tussle between us. But yeah, you get quite tough because you've got to, you've got to face these young guys. Yeah. Lee McGregor, Lee never beat me, but he, he was on my tail all the time. Charles, Charles Mayer uh, also became a Springbok. Uh, yeah, and you've got, to, you've got to be tough. You've got to be hard sometimes <laughs> on the youngsters. <laughs> yeah, that is uh, that's so wonderful to you, Brian. Brian, uh, obviously, the, the, the obvious answer to my question, if I said any regrets in your swimming career, would probably most certainly be not going to the Olympics and uh, having the opportunity to compete really on the biggest stage in world swimming. But anything that Brian Stewart still want to achieve in, in, in his life, whether it's swimming or personal life or business life? Uh, I, you always have regrets. They say if you don't have regrets, you haven't lived. Yeah. Uh, there are things I could have done better, I'm sure. Uh, but I, I, don't, I don't really... I've got a couple of things I still want to do in my life, write a couple of more books. Um, and yeah, you know, have a, have a comfortable and watch my children and my grandchildren. My, my son who plays water polo for South Africa, uh, he's now mm -hmm. aiming for the Olympics, Tokyo next year. He's 40. And if he makes, he's probably the oldest uh, player in the South African team. Um, but yeah, and, and, and I, I, I get pleasure in watching them grow up and, and being good sports people and just being good human beings. That is wonderful to hear, Brian. Kobe Skeber said, we must a little bit Afrikaans praat, because you are an Afrikaans boy from Namibia. So I will end up to say, Brian, very, very thank you for the, in the first place, that you Spartan Swim Club began in Windhoek, because it had my opportunity to get to the first time professional afrachting to get. But also your contribution to South African Swim and that you so ongelooflik baie belang stel steeds in swem. Ek, ek, ek meen, jy het, jy het geantwoord op my heel eerste video's, het jy al betrokken geraak en gesels. Ek denk, jy was baie betrokken op Kobus uh, Facebook groepen en alles. Uh, so ek wil uit, die, uit my hart uit sê, Brian, jy is een inspirerende mens. Uh, dankie vir die harde werk. Dankie as africhter, wat jy nog meer mense geimpakteer het. En ek wens jou ongelooflike gezonde en gelukkige leven toe. Saam met jou kinders en jou kleinkinders. Baie dankie, uh, Thijs, ja. Uh, ek praat baie lekker Afrikaans hier in Natal. Kijk het in soos ek eerst daarvan praat. Nou al bieke verroes geraak, maar uh, ja, uh, ek en my vrou, my vrou is Afrikaans, my ma was Afrikaans. Yes. En uh, ja, is, uh, ek en baie, baie Afrikaanse vriende uh, bieke van die liberale kant. <laughs> Goed. Uh, uh, Brian, thank you very much and uh, I'm so glad we we stuck to it because we had to try three times. I mean, we we really persevered with this interview, but I think it was 
you have a fantastic uh, career. You've got interesting stories. I think uh, we can catch up again because I think I haven't heard half the stories. Some stories that probably you don't want to tell. Talk about what happens on tour, stays on tour, but that's also good. Uh, but yeah, I really, I really enjoyed it. And I'm glad we, we stuck to our guns and we managed to get this interview done. Thanks very much. I'm, 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 I apologize. I'm, a, uh, I'm not technologically that sophisticated, but at least we got going. No, and we, I must we, thank we, you yeah. for the, for the uh, absolutely massive contribution I think you're making. Um, uh, I think the whole swimming world is, is actually agog uh, at the moment to hear who you're going to interview next and yeah. find out what has happened to that person. And I think it's an amazing, amazing initiative in your part. Thanks very much for what you do. No, as you said, you know, as a coach, it was never, it's, it's, for me, it's never difficult to do this. In fact, I get goosebumps talking to these legends who, who I only read about. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely humbled by the fact that Jonah Harrison gave me time and, and spoke to me. And, and something that, that really impacted me was when Peter Rocky, someone who I'd never heard of and had such an amazing swimming career, when, when I said to his son, you know, if, if your dad's going to talk to us, won't you ask him to wear his Springbok blazer and bring his medal with? And, and when the, the image of his dad actually appeared on the screen, I was emotional. I, was, I thought, wow, here's this legend of a swimmer and he's actually dressed up in his Springbok blazer to talk to me. So yeah. in a, in a, I hope in a small way people are getting joy out of it. They've all afterwards sent me messages saying, you know, my dad really lit up. Even Joan Harrison came back and said, you know, she enjoyed, and she doesn't enjoy talking to people. Uh, she enjoyed sp speaking to me. So I'll, I'll keep on doing this. I've got Anne Fairley lined up. I've got a good couple of guys. I've got Lee McGregor lined up in December. I'm going to speak to Oscar Chalupski uh, when he's back from Portugal because he nearly throttled me when I beat him in the surf swim only once. Uh, there, there are so many names that are still propping up and uh, I hope yeah. to continue to do this. But, but thanks for talking to me. I really yeah. enjoy it. This building that you're in here uh, actually belongs to Herman Chalupski. No way. This is where our, this is where our restaurant and our pub and our brewery, brewery is. I'm the brewer, and uh, and uh, Herman and uh, uh, well, uh, Oscar is actually quite ill, but uh, Herman is here every second day. Uh, very good friends of, with my kids, and uh, yeah, so small small world. Yeah, Herman was a legend. When I did my surf lifesaving for Western Province, we could never beat the, the Natal boys. Uh, my direct opposition was a guy called Graham Hill and uh, obviously Julian Taylor and all those, you know, Paul Blackbeard yeah. was maybe in the first years that I competed, Paul was still there. We, 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 were, we were gunning for second place when we were competing in these. Yeah. It was yeah. just unfair how good they were. But in the, <laughs> in the end, we're all part of the same community and that's what makes it special. Well, have a beer on, have a beer on me and uh, enjoy well, your weekend. Thank you very much. Brian. I had a beer before we, I had a beer before we started.